Good morning. Happy Monday morning. If not, happy Monday is not an oxymoron. <clears throat> Today we're going to take a look at um, <clears throat> uh, Marx's questionnaire, a worker questionnaire, um, <clears throat> which he published in a French uh, journal. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, 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 uh, it's interesting for a number of reasons. Of course, with any kind of questionnaire, and undoubtedly you've done questionnaires in your own lives, and um, the, the questionnaire is only, or the, the answers you get from a questionnaire are only as good as the questions you ask. Okay? <clears throat> In other words, if you, if you ask a, a poorly framed question, you're going to get a less than usable serviceable answer. Okay, anyway, his, his uh, uh, Marx's worker questionnaire is, um, <clears throat> well, needless, it's, it's, it, it's notable. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is your occupation? <clears throat> well, remember, <clears throat> work for both um, Hegel and for Marx. Work is the basis of your identity. Right? What work you do, that's the identity that you have. So his first question is, what is your occupation? He didn't say, what is your name? Oh, no. Um, well, let's see. Let's take a look a little further. This, the, the questionnaire begins on page 208. In other words, what is your occupation? Now, what is your name? Why not, put, why not ask for the person's name? Well, of course, uh, today you'd say, well, that's invas an invasion of privacy. <clears throat> but um, what is, here's, here's what he says over on page 219, uh, about a third of the way down the page. Um, <clears throat> the individual who is no longer related to other men or even the appearance of a general bond and create a general conflict between man and man, individual and individual, so the whole of civil society is only this mutual conflict of all individuals who are no longer distinguished by anything but their individuality. Right? In other words, instead of asking what, um, what your name is, uh, Marx said, well, do you have a social security number, right? An S-S-N, right? <clears throat> um, that, that is individual, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> one problem, another problem with questionnaires, right? Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, another problem with questionnaires is simply the fact that they can be too long. And most certainly, Marx's um, <clears throat> worker questionnaire goes on for about almost a dozen pages, right? There are over a hundred questions. And some of them get down to details, like, for example, what are the prices, number 69, what are the prices of necessity such as rent, um, <clears throat> dwelling costs, right, et cetera, clothing, et cetera. Oh, here's food, bread, meat, vegetables, potatoes, milk, eggs, fish, butter, oil, lard, sugar, salt, spices, coffee, chicory, beer, cider, wine, tobacco? Hmm. <clears throat> the, okay, now, the ordinary worker who would know the prices of all those things uh, would be obsessive, compulsive, relative to detail, right? Um, one, of the, one of the problems with uh, Marx's questionnaire, worker questionnaire, is that there are too many questions, and it goes on forever, and it's not surprising that um, the um, the, the, oh yeah, in, in the following issue, right, 
the journal mentioned that very few replies had been received. Big surprise there. And asked its readers to send in their replies as quickly as possible. Well, the year, a year later, the journal went out of existence anyway, so it didn't make much difference. <clears throat> okay, anyway, there's a, the example of Marx's questionnaire. But again, it's, it's the first question that's really important in the, uh, because that indicates both Hegel's and Marx's um, view that the identity of the human being is determined uh, largely by his occupation. Okay, <clears throat> enough on that. Let's move over to um, he, <clears throat> uh, what he, the area, it's called uh, the sociology of politics. <clears throat> okay, and it begins on page 215. Um, and follow it. <clears throat> okay, let's take, uh, let's take a look on page 260. Uh, re remember uh, what the state is for Marx, right? Politics, like state. State is ab an abstraction, right? Okay. <clears throat> and of course, abstract in the terminology of Hegel and Marx, abstract means separate, right? The state is separate, and it's um, separate, um, one-sided, and, and therefore untrue, right? Why is it one-sided? Well, because it's what is the state, according to Marx. The state and the structure of society are not, from the standpoint of politics, two different things. Okay, so what is the state? It's the structure of society. <clears throat> okay, let's go a little further. Insofar as the state admits the existence of social evils, okay, what's the society? The society is people working together. Okay, now, <clears throat> state is abstract. This is concrete. Okay. <clears throat> and needless to say, abstract is bad, concrete is good. <clears throat> um, concrete in this tradition, in Hegel and in Marx, means growing up together with. Together. Growing up together with. <clears throat> So, insofar as the state admits the existence of social evils, okay, consider a social evil. Uh, let's take a social evil. Um, what's a social evil? Um, opioids. I don't know whether that's a social, that's not the current social evil. The current social evil is the coronavirus. <clears throat> Yeah, it really is a social evil. All right. <clears throat> um, okay, insofar as the state admits the existence of social evils, sometimes they don't admit it. I mean, for example, uh, Putin, <laughs> the present president of Russia, um, refuses to admit that Russia has a coronavirus problem. Right? Um, <clears throat> in other words, rulers can stay in denial. Denial is not simply for individual in their psychology. Uh, denial is, can also be in, uh, by a state. The, the government can deny that certain problems exist um, <clears throat> until they come to their attention and they can't totally ignore them. Okay, insofar as the state admits the existence of social evils, it attributes them to natural law. Okay, now why it does the opioid crisis, well, there's some kind of a natural law here. <clears throat> What's the natural law? I suppose you'd say, well, it's the natural law of addiction. <clears throat> um, against which no human power can prevail. And well, I mean, how to, to prevail against an addiction is not easy. <clears throat> okay. Um, or to private life. Right? Well, it's a private concern, right? 
which is independent of the state. Not my problem. How often <clears throat> does that does not does one not hear that from leaders in authority, right? No, it's not my problem. It's somebody else's. <clears throat> um, to private life or to the inadequacies of the administration which is subordinate to it, right? You blame <laughs> you you blame some lower agency for the problem that is really that you really are responsible for. Um, um, blame the WTO, right? The the not the the world world health WHO, the World Health Organization. Blame the blame that, or blame China. Oh yeah, China is always a good scapegoat. <laughs> blame anybody. Okay, which is subordinate to it, or you, or you can uh, you can condemn the uh, CDC, the what's that acronym for? The acronym for the CDC, the uh, for disease control, the Center for Disease Control. Got it, CCD, right. CDC. Um, in other words, uh, well, they are somewhat blamable because they came up with a test for the coronavirus which was, shall we say, defective. Um, okay, so back to our story. Uh, thus, in England, poverty is explained by the natural law according to which population increases beyond the means of subsistence. Okay, there, uh, what, what uh, Marx is talking about there is uh, Malthus. <clears throat> and his theory um, regarding populations. And uh, the difficulty there is the, 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 the amount of food available uh, is, uh, uh, follows arithmetical uh, progressions, arithmetical progression, uh, whereas the, um, the population uh, is geometrical progression. In other words, which means the population always, um, <clears throat> always exceeds the available food resources. Okay. Which of course is a recipe for, uh, according to Malthus, total disaster. <clears throat> and that's what causes pauperism. Um, however, uh, of course, needless as we as we know, uh, Malthus's predictions were totally incorrect. He, fa he failed to take into account the uh, immense possibilities of modern science and uh, agronomy. Okay, well, um, fertilizer, something as simple as that, and then many other factors: better seeds, better farm practices, etc. Um, okay. So from another uh, aspect, England explains populism, pauperism, excuse me, as the consequence of the evil dispositions of the poor. They're too lazy to work. Um, just as the king of Prussia um, explains it by the unchristian disposition of the rich. The rich are not giving alms uh, enough to the poor. Okay. And th as the convention, this is something in France, uh, explains it as the skeptical counter-revolutionary outlook of the property owners. In other words, uh, the revanchists uh, of the French Revolution. Okay. Accordingly, England inflicts punishments or penalties on the poor. What did England do to solve the pauperism problem or the poverty? Put them in workhouses. Okay. Um, or uh, and if they couldn't pay their debts, into debtor's prison. And when the debtor prison got too full, um, they would ship them to one of their colonies, otherwise known as Australia. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, which is the one reason why there are a lot of Irish names in Australia. 
course, quite a few English names, too. Anyway, back to our story. So uh, accordingly, England inflicts po uh, penalties on the poor, puts them in the workhouses or in debtors' prisons. The king of Prussia admonishes the rich. You're supposed to give more money to the poor. And the convention beheads property owners. <laughs> well, of course, the convention, uh, it's one of the, the um, uh, it beheaded the aristocrats. It took care of that problem. OK, so um, simply, uh, so why, why do these evils really occur? Simply because the administration is the organizing activity of the state. The contradiction between the aims and good intentions of the administration, the aims and the good intentions, um, and of course, needless to say, in this matter, Marx would uh, remind Christians that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, the good intentions of the administration on the one hand and its means and resources on the other. Well, no state is, uh, has absolute total sufficiency to solve the problem of poverty. We saw that in Hegel, right? Hegel saw the problem and he saw that he couldn't solve it or saw that, and we saw that he didn't solve it. Uh, well, Marx would agree with Hegel on that score. Um, <coughs> Uh, no state has the means or resources to solve totally the problem of poverty in its society. Um, now, um, if you recall, President Johnson established the war on poverty. Right? Now, whether President Johnson succeeded in winning that war, I will leave that to historians to consider. Okay, back to our story. <clears throat> Um, the state, okay, the state is founded upon the contradiction between public and private life, right? Um, between the general and particular interest. The, the administration, okay, so, um, <clears throat> well, what have we got in this country? There is the, there's the public, there are two sectors. Two sectors of the economy, there's the public and the private. And according to Marx, both of them need to work together in, in order to um, make things work f or function properly within a particular society. And I think he's probably right. Uh, you gotta get the public and the private sector. Well, uh, a good example is, um, <clears throat> well, with the present coronavirus, right? Uh, the, C the CDC was a government agency, or is a government agency, and it attempted to uh, establish a system of testing which, uh, for the coronavirus, and, but it was, its test was tainted, or anyway, it didn't work. It didn't produce any result. Whereas uh, many of the private uh, labs, some up in Seattle, uh, were very good at developing testing and, uh, and also in a much more accurate way. But uh, unfortunately for the entire country, that's simply, it's too small a percentage, right? In other words, you, you, can't, you can't expect the private sector to be able to mount a national effort, uh, especially just a few uh, research facilities uh, on, the, uh, on the opposite coasts uh, to be able to solve a national problem, right? It's, uh, it's, there are limits to what the private sector is able to do. Okay, <clears throat> um, moving right along. Over on page 217. Uh, if the modern state, by the, the top paragraph there, uh, about the line four down, from on page 217. These divisions, this, this debasement of slavery of civil society are the fu natural foundation upon which the modern state rests, just as the civil society was the natural foundation of slavery upon which the state and antiquity rested. Well, <clears throat> uh, Marx makes the correct point that uh, the economies of the ancient world, Greece and Rome, were built upon uh, slavery. And the um, um, 
Okay, moving right along down to the bottom of that par top paragraph. If the modern state wished to end the impotence of its administration, in other words, not only is the private sector unable to solve national problems, but even the state cannot always solve all natural problems. I mean, for example, uh, we talked about, uh, let's, let's talk about homelessness, right? It's a tough one. <clears throat> um, hmm. So if the modern state wishes to end the impotence of it, its administration, it would be obliged to abolish the present conditions of private life. <laughs> of course, needless to say, <clears throat> if, if, the, if the problem of um, modern society is, is, according to Marx, is alienation, and of course alienation is caused by private, where we go, private property, mm -hmm. then of course if you get rid of private property, you get rid of alienation and all the problems are solved, <laughs> according to Marx. <clears throat> um, sounds good. <clears throat> uh, not easy. Okay, over on page uh, 218, uh, the top of the page there, uh, third line down. The principle of politics is the will. Okay, where is politics? Where is politics? Sociology of politics. The will. And what's the will? Well, the will is, uh, according to uh, Rousseau, it's the, uh, the volonté General. I think it's that way, if I recall. Yeah, it is. La volonté générale, the general will, right? Um, well, the will of the people. The will of the people. <clears throat> That's Rousseau. Um, <clears throat> so the principle of politics is the will. The general will. Right, the people's will. The more partial and the more perfected political thought becomes, political thought becomes, and he italicizes that word, the more it believes in the omnipotence of the will. Right? In other words, it's a form of dominating will. Uh, the less able it is to see the natural and mental limitations on the will, the less able it is to discover uh, the true sources of social evils, right? <clears throat> In other words, if, the, if you take a look at the will, right? Um, the general will, how does it go about solving the problem of homelessness, right? You say, well, it's, it's, a, it's a public sector problem, or it's a private sector problem. Well, th indeed, the private sector can um, make attempts or to alleviate the problem, right? But to make it disappear, it, it's rather doubtful that the private sector on its own can do so, um, even if it willed to do so. And when you're talking about the public sector, uh, it is quite often, well, as, as, as Mark said, it's impotent, right? It's, it, the problem is simply too big for it to solve. And <clears throat> no matter how rich or wealthy that uh, nation may be. So <clears throat> um, th there are, there <laughs> the less able it is to see the natural and mental limitations on the will. There are limitations on the general will, right? There's some things that um, <clears throat> the, well, what's one of the things that it is unable to solve? <laughs> Let's take a look over on page 222, two, two, and then we will cease and desist for today. Mm. <clears throat> okay, over on page 222, two, two, the um, lower paragraph there, uh, about uh, halfway down that paragraph, page 222. Two, two. The social power 
the multiplied productive force which results from the cooperation of different individuals, right? Well, people working together. <clears throat> um, as it is determined by the division of labor, right? Division of labor is central to both um, uh, Hegel and Marx's view of society. Well, division of labor, the structure of society. <clears throat> That's part of the structure. Um, okay, since their cooperation is not voluntary, right? Would you, you, uh, <clears throat> whether you like it or not, you're a member of the particular society, right? Because you've been born into it and inculturated into it. Um, is not voluntary but natural, uh, not as their own united power, but as an alien force outside them, right? Okay? <clears throat> Social evil, an alien force outside, an alien force outside them, okay? What is Marx talking about? <clears throat> He's talking about there are economic cycles. <clears throat> to put it simply, expansion and contraction of uh, economies, right? Um, we'll call it simply boom and bust. Okay? Boom and bust. Before the coronavirus hit, we were boom. <laughs> Uh, how do you know we were a boom? Well, because the... Um, don't look at the stock market as an indication whether it is boom or bust. The stock market is either six months behind or six months ahead. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, as also NASDAQ. NASDAQ is mostly uh, uh, tech stocks, high tech stocks. <clears throat> If you want to know exactly where the economy is, take a look at the S&P 500, right? And today it was, the Dow Jones was, now you say, well, what's going on here? <clears throat> the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ are either six months behind or six months ahead. The S&P 500 is probably telling you where the economy really is right now. Okay? <clears throat> there are cycles of boom and bust. That's one of Marx's um, contributions to economic theory. And as he goes on to say, <clears throat> an alien force existing outside them, right? Outside individuals, but also outside politics, the state, right? the nation. The society of whose origin and purpose they are ignorant. Who knows why the boom go, goes as far as it does uh, in the stock market. There's a bull market and the bear market. Right. <clears throat> the um, who, <laughs> if you're very clever, you can kind of guess, right? But. Um, <clears throat> of whose origin and purpose they are ignorant. Nobody knows, right? Does the president know? No. Does the Fed know? Well, there's, there, the Fed is made up of some very bright economists from different parts of the country, different federal banks throughout the country. And of course, when they, they get together and have a meeting and try to figure out what, what to do relative to the money supply, right? That's about all they can do. Can they do anything about booms and busts? Well, once they happen, they can try to anticipate. Once they happen, uh, they're kind of, they have a few tools, but not a great, not, not enough to totally control what happens. Okay, so, um, whose origin and purpose they are ignorant and which they therefore cannot control, right? but which, on the contrary, passes through on its own proper series of phases and stages, right? In other words, economists have been predicting that there was going to be a bust soon, 
right? They thought it might happen in 2020. <clears throat> um, many. H however, uh, the, uh, where's the coronavirus? <laughs> it's not there. Anyway, um, the, the coronavirus proved the trigger for what is likely going to be a bust. Mm -hmm. A period, an economic downturn. So, on the contrary, it passes through its own proper series of phases and stages, independent of the will and action of man. There's not anything anybody can do about it. Even appearing to govern this will and action. Who's in charge? <laughs> the economy. <laughs> Who's in charge of the economy? The economy. <laughs> okay, anyway, on that depressing note, <clears throat> we'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>